We have started to record the most recent session of SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session. It is Thursday, June 8th, 2023. I think we got off to a very positive start yesterday with day one of demonstrative speeches. In just a moment, I'm going to go to the Class Collaborate Ultra video playing segments of what we were doing yesterday with that first day of speeches. I wanted to indicate a couple of things before we get started, Howard. There were some of you who were scheduled to go today who either sent me an incompatible format in terms of video or I would open a file and nothing was there. I sent each of those individuals an email letting you know that you need to resend it to me. And in those emails, I said, go to your sent file, make certain that you can see and hear your video after you've sent it to me. If there's an issue, go ahead and resend. There's someone who is here with us live today who faces that circumstance. And this individual is going to re-record, send it to me, and I'll play it on Monday. There are a couple of you who have never been in contact with me about presentations. If that's the case, you either need to seriously consider dropping the course or make certain that you can get access to it on a regular basis. We've got major presentations every week, and it's really important that everyone follow what's on the syllabus. Students need to be especially proactive in online courses. If there are any issues, remember, I am always here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in the one o'clock to three o'clock time block. It's not a requirement for people to be here live, but I want to make certain that this is as rewarding an experience for all of you as possible. But I can't help you if I am not in contact with you. Let's go to Blackboard and double check the video clips from yesterday. As I said, considering the fact that you're starting presentations literally within eight calendar days or seven calendar days from the first day of class, depending upon whether you're on day one, a Wednesday, or day two, a Thursday, we did quite well. Here is our video on Class Collaborate Ultra. Let's pick up bits and pieces from our most recent class session. We have started to record the most recent session of SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session. It is Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. This is demonstrative speech day one. Those of you who are watching the video after the fact notice our start time is a little bit later live, primarily because of this reason. I want to make certain that all of the presentations that you have sent me are easily available for everyone during a live class to see and to hear. You put a lot of time and effort into these, and it's really important that everything be shown exactly the way that you want them to be seen, in this case, for any kind of demonstrative activity. I had one individual send me an email last night to my SAU address indicating they were having some internet issues. It happens in an online course. So if you're in that position, make certain that you get me your data tonight or by class time tomorrow as time goes on. With that said, you'll notice that our first speaker comes across in a very comfortable fashion on camera, very likable, very knowledgeable. All of you are going to have issues with grammar early on, and I'll get to that, but always in such a manner where I'll say there are some things that you need to work on, but right now it's really not going to affect your grade. For all of you, whenever you go back and watch the videos over and over again, you might see something in cringe, but it's an issue, not an error. It is an issue to learn design in terms of color, the consistency of the font, how you can express emotions, the inspiration, conversational here, talking about it from a serious perspective, things that I use to write. This is important because those of you who are very creative that are writers or poets, you may not necessarily use a journal or a pen. Maybe neutral colors such as black, navy, gray, and brown. 
women should wear pants or dresses to the knees, and men should wear matching suits such as the matching jacket, pants, the top your shoes. But dressing professionally to a job interview is very important. Step seven, arrive on time. Showing up on time can be a good look for the interview, such as you. Be at least 15 minutes early to get your thoughts together and to review answers to questions that might be given to you in the interview. And some of the rest of you have a tendency to rely on um as a transitional device between a main point. Early on, that's not a big issue. Like me, you watch the videos over and over again. When that time comes up, and I'm including these pauses for effect, then, and only then, do you continue. We feel awkward sometimes in normal conversation. Keep in mind, for all of you, when you're recording something on Loom, slideshow, from beginning, or in this case, from the most recent slide. Hi, my name is Arnie and it'll Anderson, start to play. and today in that particular mode. Let's look at our slides. The history of braids, look at the design consistency all the way through with those bullet points where she can remain extemporaneous. You can actually play each of these individual video clips slide by slide here, but it would be really cumbersome, which is the reason for slideshow from beginning. What you will need, there's no deal. Next week, I don't want to see any of these on the screen during a performance, so double check that. No bearing on anyone's grade now. Nice job of putting together all of these items involving makeup. Look at her expressive nature as we go from one area to the next. Same thing here with step two. Step three, all of the different artistry, which it really is in terms of making a smoky eye, for instance. Step four, and this is where when, everyone's, when anyone says they're putting on their face, they really mean it because there really is for all of you. My storytelling ability today is literally having more than a dozen different tabs up on the screen because I'm serving with my mass communication experience really as a television director, wanting to showcase your abilities. And when I pause your speeches afterwards and look at them, I am always viewing it from the standpoint of if you do the things I ask, because I've been around for a long time in media and speech, if you do the things I ask and you become more self-aware of your abilities with content, with delivery, with visuals, <clears throat> and I'm using my hands here intentionally, hopefully the grades will take care of themselves. Hopefully nothing lower than an A or a B, because that's the way I view things. I want all of you to do well grade-wise, and I'm couching my constructive criticism in a positive way. And if I say something more than once, or if I notice that you're having an issue with vocalics or something else, I'm always going to say, watch it closely and be aware of it. Not that, oh, that's a terrible mistake. You're not aware that you're doing it. So for those of you who are ready to go tomorrow, watch the course video, look at your classmates, practice and then send me by loom as as you saw with miss henderson something that is on powerpoint where your visuals on the screen anything like that works but always go slideshow from beginning full screen and only then do you put your webcam up on the screen not going to affect anybody's grade now because we're doing quite well but let's make certain that week by week you become more polished and by the end of the term you're going to feel very comfortable as a public speaker. That's what I'm looking for. So let's continue the progress on day two tomorrow for demonstrative speeches. As for SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session of 2023. That concludes the recording session for today. I should mention something before I go any further. Whenever I'm playing these course videos, I'm picking them up at random times. It just so happens that when we were looking at all of our presenters from day one for demonstrative presentations, we were after all of the speeches. So you're catching me in progress, looking at your eye contact, looking at your organizational structure, looking at your slides, examining the content and the delivery 
and the visuals. One thing that you all need to remember, especially when you're putting something in the PowerPoint or Google Slides mode, when you are ready to present, and I talked about this yesterday, but I wanted to be back on camera to reinforce this. I should not see all of your slides on the far left-hand side. Remember, you go slideshow from beginning, and then it goes full screen. Then and only then should you determine what area of the screen you are going to place your webcam, either in Loom or in PowerPoint, as you saw from Zaria's presentation on braiding hair. Her video is in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. We should not be in a situation situation or something like that where you actually have to physically move your webcam go from one slide to the other that's not the way it works so make certain that that is much more smooth as time goes on let's return to blackboard for a couple of items including how you can access any of the any of the videos that we've used so far including yesterday we are now at six of 19 scheduled course sessions for the first summer session. We're in the student preview mode. You can watch all of these. I'm guessing most of you will be focusing on your own presentations because they're played all the way through. Some of you, if you're using YouTube and you're recording off of a smartphone, most of the time, because your audio is going to be a little bit harder to hear with the microphone from the smartphone being physically back a little bit more than your webcam microphone, that's my rationale for putting on closed captioning so it is easy for us to understand you with that microphone from the smartphone being just a little bit further back. Over the weekend, realistically, sometime on Sunday or Sunday evening, when you are scrolling through the area of tools, you can go to My Grades, and eventually all of the grades will be posted here for a maximum of 20 points. Then, of course, a reminder that when you're at the instructor information area, you can get a head start on informative speeches next week by checking out YouTube or with the course syllabus, the itinerary for next week is as follows. With June 12 being informative speech research, June 13, informative speech topic selection, and then the 14th and the 15th, informative speech day one and informative speech day two. I wanted to reinforce that before we get into our presentations today, just so you start to get an idea as to what you would like to discuss for informing your audience. But we'll talk about that after we get through all of our presentations today. Also at the course syllabus, this is our course speech schedule. Please make certain that if you have any kind of connectivity issue that you contact me, or if you're in a circumstance where you can't complete the assignments, that you drop the course because we need to move on no matter what. I don't want to be in a position where someone's giving me all of their presentations at the end of the term. It doesn't work that way. Students work on the schedule that is provided on the syllabus. And with that, let's begin with our first demonstrative speech of day two. This was sent to me in a slightly different format. Our first two speeches, I had to upload them to YouTube so I could play them during class. Our first speaker today is Chloe, and she is looking at how to properly vaccinate your dog at home. By the way, even though at the end of the semester, you've got 20 points for each of the four major graded speeches, 10 points for class participation, and then the other 10 points for the self-evaluation speech critique, where you write a couple of paragraphs about your overall experiences in the course, how you believe you've improved and then send that to my Yahoo email address, either as an email message or in a Microsoft Word document. But even though it is a self-evaluation speech critique, it is so helpful to look at all of the videos from your classmates in real time to pick up 
elements that you may think might help you improve, whether it's someone's organization, whether it's someone's webcam, whether it's someone's slides go profile that they've downloaded, whatever you think is appropriate to help you improve in the long run. So even though you're only going to be critiquing yourself, all of these presentations from your classmates, ideally in the long run, will give you tips about overall improvement as a public speaker. Our first presenter of the day is Chloe, and she is talking about how to properly vaccinate your dog at home. We will unmute. Here we go. Um, hey, everyone. I am Chloe Ray. I am a pre-vet major at SAU with future plans to go to vet school. So for my demonstrative speech this afternoon, I am going to be talking about how to properly vaccinate your dog at home. Now, this process can be kind of tedious for those who, you know, aren't really used to being hands-on, like cutting toenails on dogs. If your dogs aren't used to that, then it's best to take it to professionals. But for our requirements for today, you're going to need a syringe with a needle um, that will go in these little vials, which will be your vaccine. Luckily, I work at a vet clinic, so I have pretty good hands-on with all of this. Like, I'm able to get this to show, but normally one will be filled with a saline solution and the other one will be filled with the medicine. But also you will need an alcohol swab, which that's just kind of to make sure your area is good and clean. And I will say that you might need some treats just to kind of persuade your dog into working for you. Now, there's a lot of history behind vaccines, especially with dogs and other animals. Uh, the first vaccine that was ever administered was the rabies vaccine, and this testing for the vaccine started in 1885, and it was tested on dogs before it was tested on humans. Uh, the rabies virus is normally called the street virus because it was most common in street animals like raccoons, rabbits, you know, things that you normally see digging in the trash. In most states, the rabies vaccine is the only vaccine that's required, but there may be other vaccines like your booster and your kennel cough that will be needed in order to keep your dog healthy. Um, these vaccines that are needed are normally in places where like a boarding facility, a groomer, if you take your dog on vacation with you, like dog beaches or a dog park, these vaccinations are required just due to the fact that they'll be around other animals and the risk of these diseases getting spread is really, really high risk when your dog is not vaccinated. There are many steps to the vaccination process. You need to first make sure that you have your correct vaccine, which will be in the little vials. Like the rabies is normally in one vial, but your booster is normally going to be in two, which will be a saline solution in one and then a powdered medicine vaccine in the other. So you're then going to collect all of the saline solution out of the first vial. This should be about one mil. That's what you're going to use with your syringe and your needle. You're going to insert the needle into the top, which is normally a rubber piece. It'll go in there fairly easily and you will collect the saline solution out of the first vial. Then you will insert your needle with syringe into the medicine vial and push the plunger, which will then put the saline into the bottle. Then you'll like gently roll the vial in your hand. Some people, you know, kind of just wiggle it around. You, you don't want to shake it up and down just because that'll cause air bubbles and it'll be more difficult for you to draw back up. Step three is once you notice that all of the medicine, the powdered medicine is dissolved into the saline solution, it'll generally turn a color, normally pink. Uh, then you'll pull the plunger back on your syringe, which will basically suck up all of the contents into your syringe which should be about one mil or one cc. Then you'll gently turn the syringe upside down. That way the air will float to the top and you will gently push the plunger in order to get all that air out so you're not inserting that under your pet's skin. Once your medicine is all in your syringe, you'll take that alcohol pad that I was talking about. You'll clean your needle. You'll clean the spot on your pet where you're going to be inserting the needle just to make sure that everything's decontaminated and you're going to be good and you won't cause any infection or just any thing that could get in the area that could harm you or your pet. Once the area is clean, you will create what's called a skin tent. Um, 
right here on the picture that is on the slide that is my dog Dixie. I could not find any good picture examples on the internet to show y'all so I just took a picture with her of kind of creating a skin tint. You'll gently pull the skin like in between the shoulder blades. Pulling it up will create what's called a skin tint. It'll almost look like a triangle which is kind of shaped like the basic tint. Normally this is done in between the shoulder blades. Then you will gently insert the needle into your pet's skin. Once the needle is inserted, you'll pull the plunger back just to make sure you're not in any blood vessel or vein. But if you see blood, take the needle out and stick in some other area. But if there's no blood, you're good to go and you can push the plunger and administer the medicine vaccine to your pet. The question why is a really big question going around with pet owners. The question of like, why vaccinate your pet at home? Why not take them to the vet to get vetted? Um, that question you know, it has a hundred different answers that we can go with, but it's even though it's not a hundred percent safe to vaccinate your pet at home, some may find it a better option for them. Taking your pet to the vet can get really, really expensive, and some may not have those that opportunity like others do. So it's cheaper for them to just go out and buy the vaccine and then administer it at home themselves. But it's good to be educated on how to do that just in case you're ever in that situation where you find that that's something that you need to do. Uh, most places that you are going to take your pet to, like those beaches or the dog groomers or any time you travel with your pet, they consider fully vaccinated to be going and seeing a vet, getting a full checkup, making sure that your vet does not have any diseases, getting these vaccines and having records of these vaccines. That's generally a big, big deal when it comes to bringing your animals to these certain areas is having records of these vaccines to prove that your dog is vaccinated. Um, I do want to say thank you guys so much for listening to my demonstrative speech. Uh, being in agriculture has really put a big impact on my life. I have been in the vet business for about four years now. It's something that's really important to me, plus my dogs. They're really, really important. And it's honestly so, so important for you to vaccinate your animals because like like the history of the rabies vaccine, it was the street virus. It was found on the street. Your pet can pick it up from anything. Say a raccoon <clears throat> comes on your back porch and eats after your animal, and then your animal comes back to eat. They can contact the rabies virus like that or getting bitten like anything little that you can do to prevent these issues going around like vaccinating your pet is something that's so important and something that's so needed. One of the things that you probably notice behind me and it's intentionally there is a pillow with a miniature schnauzer. In this house for more than 20 years we had two miniature schnauzers and a big element of any animal's long-term success especially for dogs is being properly vaccinated early on heartworm anything that you can think of so in her case because this is something that chloe wants to do for a career it's appropriate that she utilize it as a topic let's take a look at parts of her speech going to the beginning in this case muting the audio, putting closed captioning on, checking whether or not she is speaking in complete sentences. Let's go from the beginning and check out the first 30 to 45 seconds. While she is also looking at the camera, talking about the fact that she wants to go to vet school, she discussed her dogs at the end of the presentation. I would not view the process as tedious in the long run because no matter what animals that you have, proper vaccination is going to keep them healthy in the long run. Then she goes into a transitional device from her title slide into the requirements and she's got some of the material for the requirements or syringes or vaccines right there. All of that including her background in, with vet school, is going to give her credibility as a speaker. And she is, as you can see, now that we are into the first minute or so, speaking in complete sentences. Now we'll pause it and pay particular attention to two different things. The quality of her slides 
and her eye contact, trying to first of all be extemporaneous because that's where the conversationality will naturally flow. We'll take off the closed captioning. Look at her eye contact as we move from slide to slide with the requirements showing some of the vaccine to the camera. Moving on, she moves her webcam up and down, but it really does call attention to itself depending upon where the dead spaces on a particular slide. Here discussing research involving vaccines, including rabies. Some of the steps with vaccination, again, with different types of visual aids for each of her points regarding syringes or vaccines with the steps to vaccinate. Same with three and four. Notice her eye contact. Let's again play it in real time with the closed captioning off and the audio muted, watch your eyes. You can do this with yourself. How are you concentrating going from one point to the next? Here she's talking about in step five, creating a skin tint in your pet skin. And then in point six, on pulling the plunger back to ensure you are not in a blood vessel or vein. One of the reasons that you have to study this intently when you're a student because you don't want to injure an animal. Look very closely in the back and you can see her dogs. Don't know what the breeds are. I will tell you that one of our presenters that I showed you yesterday, or that is at least on the website, she has a demonstrative speech on how to make poor man's pie. In one of her presentations a couple of years ago, you can actually see her cat in the background. She may have more than one dog there. I don't know. Then we'll move on to the why, going back to the quality of the graphics and the template that she inserted for her PowerPoint. This apparently is a PowerPoint that she has placed her webcam in. And then we move on from the why of the safety of vaccinations to the end of her presentation. Let's get into the final 45 seconds, pick up the audio, for her discussion in terms of an effective, succinct conclusion, why vaccinating your dogs is important. Uh, being in agriculture has really put a big impact on my life. I have been in the vet business for about four years now. It's something that's really important to me, plus my dogs, they're really, really important. And it's honestly so, so important for you to vaccinate your animals because like, like the history of the rabies vaccine it was the street virus it was found on the street your pet can pick it up from anything say a raccoon comes on your back porch and eats after your animal and then your animal comes back to eat they can contact the rabies virus like that or getting bitten like anything little that you can do to prevent these issues going around like vaccinating your pet is something that's so important and something that's so needed um hey everyone that's why I always ask you to wait a couple of seconds because I'm trying to watch. I'm trying to get to the end of the speech and pause. It is something that's so important and something that's. But when you have YouTube up like this, I'll go back and forth. The red line goes off the screen automatically. So I have to be very careful and occasionally it'll automatically restart. But I want to see her eyes. There we go. Nice job there at the end. For those of you who are giving your presentations with the slides, available on the left-hand side to be seen. Go into the slideshow mode so it's full screen. I don't want to see those. She did a really nice job on the concept of properly vaccinating your dog at home. And she sent it to me in a format where I downloaded it and then uploaded it to YouTube, which is a little bit different than what you're doing on Loom, even though if you're using an online PowerPoint, as we had with the braiding hair speech yesterday, I can just show it to you in real time, put it in the slideshow mode, hit play. Little things like that matter, especially when we're doing a course like this, where I want everyone to see every last minute of every last speech that you produce and breaking them down. You should be doing the same thing with your overall presentations, especially because with this term being over in three weeks, it goes by very quickly. A lot of the stuff that we learn here, especially from the course videos, will carry you far in your professional and personal lives if you continue to practice. 
This is our second demonstrative speech of the day, also uploaded to YouTube from a download to my Yahoo address. This is how to sing, and it was recorded off a smartphone. Our first presenter was right around seven minutes. In this case, it's just under four. All of you, and I haven't talked about this a lot, all of you need to have a smartphone near you with a timer to make certain that if you're recording this way, you're somewhere in the area of four to six minutes, which is the requirement on the syllabus. Not going to be a big thing here, but keep that in mind. You put a lot of time and effort into these speeches, and it's really important that you don't necessarily give yourself short shrift when it comes to talking about your subject matter. As I had indicated a few minutes ago, one of the reasons that I always have closed captioning on during speeches that are recorded off smartphones is the location of the microphone is physically further back than maybe turning this around and recording it off a webcam. This is our second presenter of the day, and this is how to sing. Hi, my name is Akira Jenny, and today I'll be doing my presentation over how to sing. So the first thing we're going to start off with is body warm ups. Body warm -up, warm ups give your body a chance to loosen up. It also releases tension and reduces um, in, in, injuring your diaphragm. So you can always do left to right and toe touches as you can see here on the presentation. The next thing we'll be doing, grounding breaths. Grounding breaths help you your tone and it makes your voice fuller and it allows you to project sound better. So one thing that you can do with your grounding breath is standing or sitting, excuse me. <clears throat> sitting with your feet flat on the floor, making sure your shoulders and chest are width apart and breathing in and breathing out. In and out. Okay. okay, so the next thing we'll do is facial warm ups. Facial warm ups can help, like, with your bones in your face. You can get your things, you can, your hands, excuse me, get your hands in. You can also move your face without touching it. You can do things like this E, A, I, O, U. Okay. And they also allow you to project your sound better. So when you move your face, your vocal cords kind of move with it because, you know, we're right here together. Okay, so next we'll be doing singing scale. <clears throat> so, of course, we start off with our low do, do. Then we have our re, re. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa. That was wrong. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Ti, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. And then we can also do skips. Do, do, re, do. Do, re, mi, re, do. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. And back to um, your body warm ups. You can also, I'm just doing a visual thing with it. You can go from side to side. Twist, trumps. Now. <clears throat> also, with your breathing, you can do lip trickles. <clears throat> also, other vocal warm ups, you can go hey, hey, hey! or you can sing a song. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose seat was white as snow. Thank you. 
it's really gutsy for you guys to give presentations like this where you're talking about singing, you're doing the vocal exercises. That's not always something that people feel comfortable with. The only thing that I feel cheated by is if I wish there were more. But again, early on, if you don't quite make four minutes, it's not going to have any bearing on your grade. However, starting next week, be very cognizant of the time. Most of our speeches are going to average somewhere around five minutes. When you take a look at her notes from the laptop over her right shoulder, there's probably a lot more information that she could discuss in detail. But I would tell her the same thing that I've been telling everyone else. Make certain that the slides that are available here are not seen during your presentation, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Loom, whether it's on PowerPoint with video, make this full screen. That way it's easier for ourselves as an audience to discuss and evaluate what she has here. Let's mute the audio, go back, and in this case, just pick up her eye contact as she begins the presentation. We'll take off the closed captioning for the time being. It's helpful to have someone, as was the case here, to be your camera operator because when she stands up to do some of the physical exercises, it comes in handy. You can always tell, by the way, whether it's this setup or on Loom, how much you practice because she has, she comes across in a very natural style. She does have a habit, and I didn't notice this when the closed captioning was on. She, as some of you have a habit, instead of using a vocalic in between points, occasionally you might, as she did, as you saw earlier, have a few okays. As time goes on, that's going to more naturally be lessened. Moving on to another item of the screen, the facial warm-ups, talking about it. Moving on, let's get into the last minute and a half of the speech and bring up the audio and evaluate her singing in a positive way. And then we can also do skips. Do, do, re, do. Do re mi re do, do re mi fa mi re do, do re mi fa so fa It's very helpful, by the way, when she goes up and down the scale. This is very good. I like this. So mi re do. And then when she gets into the last minute of the speech, we've talked about this all during the term. Oftentimes when you're trying to think of something to say, your eyes are going to wander. Your brain clicks on something. And then the conversationality kicks in from the extemporaneous quality. Pay attention in the last minute, not only to what she's saying, but pay attention to her eye contact. So, um, your body warm ups, you can also, I'm just doing a visual thing with it. You can go from side to side, twist, trumps, and then now. <clears throat> also, with your breathing, you can do lip trills. <clears throat> also, other vocal warm-ups, you can go hey, 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 or you can sing a song. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. Little lamb, Mary had a little lamb whose feet was white as snow. Thank you. Looking at yourself in a critical but positive way, like we have with all of the speeches so far this semester, it's not just a matter of doing the speech, getting it over with, and just wiping your brow and thinking, oh gosh, now we can move on to informative next week. No, no, it's more than that. All of the takes that we never see. Where do you have a dead spot? 
are you remaining smooth with your delivery? It feels like with all of these breakdowns, your speeches are much longer because I just don't play them and move on. I'll play bits and pieces. Look at your visuals. Look at your eye contact. Look at your conversationality. And that's what all of you need to do. I don't necessarily break down a speech. And I'll come back on camera for this. I don't necessarily break down all of your speeches the same way I might have in my high school or college public speaking courses where you've got Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, the subheadings, because then it becomes more formulaic where you're reading something off of a screen or you're reading something off of a sheet of paper and it takes away from the spontaneity of the speech. Don't get me wrong. Research is important. But you can probably get away with minimal research if you're well-spoken, you're smart, and you've got a thoughtful style of presentation. All of that matters. How do you carry yourself as a speaker? You just don't want to read off of a sheet of paper because that is incredibly boring. And it's also cheating to a certain extent, because really the only people who would read from a manuscript are more often than not newscasters and politicians. If you're a politician, you have to read everything word for word because something could be misunderstood halfway around the world. That's not the kind of that's not the kind of structure that we're facing here. So I appreciate the freewheeling style. And it's something that I've always encouraged based off of your bullet points from your text, the images or the videos that you provide. It's a little bit different when you're doing something off of YouTube when you have your laptop off to the side, but it doesn't mean it can be any less interesting or relevant. That brings us to our third presenter of the day. This is going to be a cooking speech and we go back to Loom with Jalissa, and she is discussing how to make chicken tamales. And here we go. Hello, my name is Jalissa Olivares, and the topic I have chosen today is how to make chicken tamales. I chose this subject because every Christmas, me, my family, and friends come together to make these tamales. The ingredients you'll be using for the tamales are maseca, shortening, salt, corn husk, caldo de pollo, ancho chili pepper, which adds the color and flavor to the masa, chicken, onions, pepper, garlic, and ground cumin. Some kitchen materials you will use is a bowl, a tortillera, a spoon, and a big pot or steamer. When you are preparing the ingredients, you want to wash the corn husk and the chicken. While the corn husk are being washed and the chicken is done being clean, you want to boil the chicken in salt and onions and leave it there until it is done. While the chicken is cooking, you want to make the masa while you're in the process. When you make the masa, you need maseca, shortening, caldo de pollo, the salt and seasonings, and the ancho chili pepper. Once the chicken is finished, you want to take it off the bone. To know when your masa is ready, here is an example provided. In translation, she said that she kneaded her masa for 20 minutes and in order to test to see if it was ready, she put it in a cup of cold water and if it floats, it means it's ready. After everything is ready, cooked and set up, you want to choose an area where you want to start making the tamales. Uh, the kitchen table is the most preferable place since it has the most space for all the stuff you're about to use. The first thing you want to do is spread the masa on the core husk with a tortillera or a spoon. 
Both methods are used commonly. After you put the masa on the corn husk, you want to put the chicken on the masa. Then, after you have made every single tamal, you want to fold it in the corn husk and let it sit in the steamer for about an hour until the tamale comes out the corn husk smoothly. After that, you enjoy. You enjoy the time that you just spent cooking and making with your family, having fun, and enjoying the delicious food you have made. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to my presentation. It's always helpful if you can include, as Jalissa did, video describing some of the process. It all depends upon the circumstances, but especially something with cooking feels as if it is appropriate for a circumstance like this. Let's go back to the beginning of the presentation, mute her audio, put it in closed captioning, check her first minute, for the complete sentence structure of her delivery. For some reason, I am not getting captions. Let's try it again. I haven't talked about this a lot, but the only thing that I do with your presentations is to get them ready before class time online. I never look at them in totality until we're watching them in real time live or you're watching them on a delayed basis with the videos online. For some reason, the closed captioning is not working here. It's got no bearing on her grade. Instead of focusing on that, let's go back to her title slide and focus on her eye contact when it comes to delivery. Probably the only piece of constructive criticism I would give is possibly record in a location where there is slightly better light and maybe zoom the webcam in so we don't have all of this extra space above your head. Focusing here and just above. Early on, it has no bearing on your grade, but it's something to consider. The slides are pretty clean, pausing now and going from her title slide with attractive visuals of the tamales and her name to moving on with the ingredients at the same time, examining her eye contact and ability to remain extemporaneous in the upper left-hand portion of the screen. All of the ingredients with all of these items basically serving as de facto bullet points and the images of some of the ingredients. The kitchen materials, including the tortillera, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that is it on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Preparing the materials. Putting it in this format is so helpful because those four items on the left in green and the four phrases on the right in gray are going to serve as jumping off points to discuss the husk, the chicken, taking it off the bone, kneading the masa. If she or anyone else doing a speech like this is discussing the ingredients, it gives you an opportunity to discuss at length or in a shorter version, what's relevant about washing or cooking or taking or kneading. It really does help you in the overall scope of things be much more interesting as a demonstrative speaker, including with the video clip here. Let's pick this up with the audio. Here is an example provided. Now, if she wants, she can go ahead and talk her way through the process if she's not going to include audio on the video clip if it's not if it's not relevant. It looks like there's no audio there anyway, other than maybe natural sound. But if any of you want to talk your way through this, it's appropriate. In translation. She said that she thing, needed Alyssa, I would do is once the video is concluded, I would X out the material right here so we can see the full screen. 
And then we move on to after everything is ready, setting up the area with the tortillera, putting chicken on it. And all of a sudden, we get to the enjoyment part of the present duct being right there and very, very tasty. Before your time, there was a candidate running for president of the United States who had not apparently eaten a tortilla or apparently had not eaten an item like this with the tamale, as you can see here, beginning and end, and started to eat the tamale with the husk on. That was obviously poor advance work by his, by his team, but I can still remember how funny that was. And that is the end of the presentation on chicken tamales. We'll leave that there for a moment because whenever I access any of the material on Loom, this is what I see. I showed it to you yesterday, but this is what I will see. I'll mute the audio and I'll always start to play it, make it full screen for the perfect experience. But as I said, Jalissa, probably want to take the webcam and make it a little bit tighter. But so far, with our first three presenters, you've done a nice job. That brings us to our next speech of the day. And this is also on Loom. It is how to make stuffed peppers. There's a little bit of extra video at the beginning of the presentation, but I want you to see it exactly the way that I do. There's the slideshow. We will play it from triple zero. Here we go. Let me double check to make certain that I hit play. Hi, my name is Brooklyn Perry. And for my demonstrative speech today, I'll be doing how to make stuffed peppers. So going into a little bit of the history of stuffed peppers is that the exact origin is unknown, but records have been shown dating back to like the 1890s that stuffed peppers were in cookbooks. So how peppers came to be or thought of or created was that a lot of different countries were buying and farming peppers all around the same time, which led to the, someone having the idea of stuffing them for a meal which it became a very popular meal, so they did that. Going into the ingredients list, all you need is the bell peppers, obviously. You need ground beef, taco seasoning, cheese, and rice. So going into your first steps is that you cut your peppers. Me personally, I cut my peppers like shown on the left, but some people prefer to cut their peppers shown, like shown on the right. Either way, it's totally fine. It's not gonna hurt anything. After I cut my peppers, I take the stems off, which they're really easy. I just pull them off and I take the seeds out. If you cut like the one on the right, your seeds are already gonna be out. I mean, your stem is already gonna be out. So you'll just need to take your seeds out and you can plumb with your hands. You can scrape them out with a spoon, whatever works for you. And then after that, I wash my peppers and then most of the seeds will come out after you wash them. <clears throat> this next step is boiling your peppers, which is optional. If you like soft peppers that you don't like the crunch, then you'll want to boil them, but don't boil them too much because you still put them in the oven at the end and that will soften them up just a little bit. Me personally, I do not boil my peppers. I like the crunchy and if you like the crunch, crunchy peppers, do not boil them. Me personally, I do not boil them. I've only boiled mine once and it was when I first got my braces and I wanted to eat some peppers and I couldn't bite into the pepper because it was so crunchy. So I ended up having to boil them and leave them in the oven for a little longer. But otherwise, I do not boil them. <clears throat> Going into step two is browning your beef and making your rice. So usually I make my rice around the time that I'm cutting my peppers and taking the stem and seeds out. 
because rice does take a little longer to cook and get done. Once you are done browning your beef, you will season it like you're making tacos. Once your beef and your rice is done, you will mix them together and that's going to be your stuffing for your stuffed peppers. Going into your last steps and serving is that you're going to stuff your peppers. So if you cut your peppers with the tops off, then it's kind of easier to stuff at times because they sit up on their own and they can go into the oven. But if you cut them straight down the middle, sometimes they're not going to be cut perfectly and they will fall over and stuff. So usually I put my peppers side by side to hold each other up. These right here shown in the picture do not fall over. So sometimes you get them like that and that's great. But most of the time I put mine side by side. So after I'm done stuffing my peppers, I will preheat the oven. I preheat my oven to like three. It tells me different. And then I put a lot of cheese on top. You can also put cheese in your um, stuffing when you're mixing the rice and the beef together, or you can wait till the end and put cheese on the top either way, perfectly fine. So I just sprinkle some cheese on top and sometimes the cheese will fall off into the pan or whatever, that's fine, it's not gonna hurt anything. So after I sprinkle my cheese on, I put them in the oven and once they're in, once they're in the oven and they've been cooked for a little bit, once the cheese is melted and it's heated all the way through and the pepper is hot, you can take them out and enjoy them. <clears throat> so as far as any sides, or as far as sides, you can have any side that you want. Sometimes I make rice with some butter and sugar, or I make Mexican rice. You can eat corn with it. You can eat green beans. You can eat any type of side that you want with it, even though there's still rice in the stuffed peppers. I love rice, so I'm going to make more rice. But and usually I make too much rice, so there is more rice on the side. Or there, there's more rice that's not in the peppers, so I'd usually just eat that. But otherwise, you can have any side that you would like. So that's all I have for today. Thank you for watching my demonstrative speech. Very smooth delivery style there. It's always impressive to see individuals who practiced a lot. They go through the presentation and really doing a quality effort of being faithful to the concept of remaining extemporaneous. So let's go ahead and, in this case, look at her eye contact from the beginning while also critiquing her overall aesthetic approach to slides. Looking at the camera, I would say Brooklyn, as we'd indicated, previously with Jalissa, where I have my arrow for the cursor, bring it over and tightening it up like this so we can see your face a little bit more clearly. There's no issue with the lighting. The lighting looks pretty good all the way through, but I would probably make this a little bit tighter so we can see your face more clearly. Title slide featuring the stuffed peppers is a very attractive approach. Then we move on to the history of stuffed peppers with the three bullet points. There's no clutter to the slides. The bullet points are excellent jumping off points from one area to the other. Always appropriate in this case to discuss how they came about or the history. And then she takes some taco seasoning and places it underneath. Again, with the conversational style in the bottom left-hand corner, she is focusing on the next point and using hand gestures. I don't talk a lot about hand gestures in courses, whether they're online or in the classroom. My feeling about hand gestures is whatever is most comfortable to you. Some people will wave their hands around like traffic cops, but most of the time we're going to nat naturally punctuate whatever we want to discuss with a point or a sentence. Same thing here with the first step, again, with three different bullet points and two images in the first step. And then moving on, looking at her eye contact from one point to the next, same thing as she is still talking about the first step and then the second 
with the ground beef, three more bullet points, five bullet points for step three and serving, an attractive visual of the stuffed peppers on the far right hand side. And if you've ever had those, they really are excellent. The first time I ever had it, I thought, oh, this is basically meatloaf stuffed inside a pepper. I suppose it depends upon the recipe. But again, she's got a nice breezy pacing, no real lapses of thought. Some of you might have an um or a gonna or a kinda or an okay, but it really doesn't overtly cause attention to itself. And then let's pick up the last 45 seconds or so of her presentation and listen to it in real time. So I'm gonna make more rice, but, and usually I make too much rice, so there is more rice on the side. Or there, there's more rice that's not in the peppers, so I'd usually just eat that, but otherwise you can have any side that you would like. So that's all I have for today. Thank you for watching my demonstrative speech. And that is the end of her speech. Really quality effort when it comes to the delivery and how you can utilize visuals effectively with text and images on the slides to maximize your ability to be a quality verbal communicator. I was talking about a little bit of extra time on a presentation before we got to the beginning. It really is the next presentation we're going to get to, but I want to show you what it looks like in real time. This is another presentation that is cooking based and it is noodles. I should indicate that as we're doing this, I'm also checking my email to indicate whether someone has recent a presentation. This is noodles. And here we go. My name is Kayla Malone, and today I will be talking about Maro Chen noodles. What are Maro Chen noodles? Maro Chen noodles are one of the best and well known ramen noodle brand in the world. If Maro Chen noodles, if that name really doesn't click with you is because they're well known and you really don't go to the store and say, oh, I want some Maro Chan noodles. You just look at the packet and you know, okay, yeah, those are noodles. For the longest, I thought the Maro Chan noodles are the only noodles in the whole world, honestly. I didn't think that there were any other type of noodles in the world, honestly. Um, flavors. Maro Tran Ramen is known for its unique flavors. It has over 30 flavors. Lime chili shrimp flavor. Okay. I really don't go for this flavor. I really don't like the shrimp flavor at all. But um, lime chili shrimp and the original chili flavor sounds like it would be good. Soy sauce flavor. Now, I just recently got in the soy, soy sauce and I put soy sauce on my rice. And I haven't tried the soy sauce flavored noodles, but I think that they would taste good if they taste like actual soy sauce. Oriental, oriental flavor. I don't even know what that is, honestly. Um, this is what I meant by they have over 30 flavors and they're all unique and different. Um, I don't think that oriental is a flavor, honestly. Um, I looked it up and it said this type of ramen tastes sort of like it was soaked in soy sauce. And that's too much soy sauce for it to be soaked in soy sauce. But I am open to trying new things, so I would definitely try this flavored ramen noodle. Chicken flavor. 
I don't even have to really say too much about the chicken flavor, but it is the most top flavored ramen, the most picked ramen, and it has diversity to it. You can have chicken tortilla, you can have picante chicken, roast chicken, creamy chicken, and sriracha chicken. I've only tasted one. I don't think I would like creamy chicken, honestly, but I love spicy food. So sriracha chicken and picante chicken, I think it would, it would be good. It would be good. Beef flavor. Beef is another one of the most popular ramen noodles. And um, I would say it would be like number two, number two, um, roast beef, and it has picante beef, which I didn't know that there was a ro roast beef ramen noodle, and I didn't know that there was a picante beef ramen noodle. So the more you know. Cheddar cheese flavored. I got this off of mine. Um, the review said it didn't taste bad, but it didn't taste good. And I can see that happening. But I really, I mean, noodles and cheese, mac and cheese, you would think that it would taste good. I would see, I could see them making cheddar cheese ramen noodles. The reason I like the idea for her speech is that whenever you get to the end of it, it's something we can all identify with when we're looking at noodle-based speeches. Really interesting graphics. Let's go back to it. We had a little bit of a connectivity issue with the end of her speech, so we'll pick it up in the last minute. This is probably more of an internet thing but we will take it from roughly the point where she had the cheddar cheese noodles up and take it from there because we're in the last 45 seconds. Cheese, mac and cheese. You would think that it would taste good. I would see, I could see them making cheddar cheese ramen noodles, but I don't think that it would be good, honestly. Um, Leave it with the mac and cheese. And that is all that I have for my presentation, my little speech. And I hope you really enjoyed it. I did. I enjoyed making it. And um, see you guys later. So now I can officially applaud. I would tell her this. You don't want to wrap up a speech with a blank screen. Just go ahead and have, just leave that there. You don't want to wrap up the speech with it, with it looking like this. But I would indicate, as we've done with everyone else so far with Loom today, take that webcam and make it a little bit tighter. Let's put it in closed captioning and check with the audio down whether or not she's speaking in complete sentences with all of the ramen flavors. It appears that on some of the looms, closed captioning is not automatically popping up on the screen. So we will do a quick double check of her visuals. Any of you who have used PowerPoint knows that is a very popular template. And then we get into the different types of noodles, which are a staple of college student existence. A quick transitional device from the flavors into the shrimp, among others, the soy sauce, which really sounds nasty. I did laugh when she was talking about the oriental flavor. Let's see if we can pick up what she says about it. Because sometimes 
Unintentional humor is funny. Listen to how she describes this. Oriental, oriental flavor. I don't even know what that is, honestly. Um, this is what I meant by they have over 30 flavors and they're all unique and different. Um, I don't think that oriental is a flavor, honestly. Um, I looked it up and it said this type of ramen tastes sort of like it was soaked in soy sauce. And that's too much soy sauce for it to be. I think that's something we can all identify with and laugh at. Because whenever you have ramen noodles, they're the same noodles. It's the flavor packets that make them different. I would give you one piece of constructive criticism, though. You want to make certain that your delivery is continuous, that it's smooth, that you don't wait until you click something up on the screen to talk about it because you don't want dead spots. The visuals that are provided here are very good and serve as quality types of quality types of data image wise to remain an extemporaneous speaker but when we get into the last 45 seconds or so and i'm just going to let this play in real time remember when you get to the end of a speech don't leave the screen black keep it there or have some type of a concluding slide that's not what you should see at the end of a speech right now it won't affect your grade but you don't want to have something like that in the future, even though the presentation itself is interesting. Which brings us to our final presentation of the day on Loom. This was sent to me during class, and I will put it up for you. It is the ultimate guide to perfect skin. And here we go. Welcome. Today for my presentation, I have made the ultimate guide to perfect skin for the SBCH 1113 Public Speaking Summer Session 1, made by Janelle Welch, me. Some areas of skincare. In ancient Egypt, it was the first recorded proof of having a skincare routine. Back in 3000 BC, they used products such as olive oil, ostrich eggs, dough, and oils made from plants and herbs. It was once said that Cleopatra bathed in sour milk to keep her skin smooth. In pre-modern Europe, they were also fond of using herbs, seeds, plants, and oatmeal, which are very common to this day as well. In the 1900s, things began to expand much quickly with the use of laser treatments and chemical peels, but are much safer now than before. Here are the steps of routine. Of routine. Step one, you need a cleanser. It's required to have a cleanser in your skin routine if you plan on starting. A cleanser will remove all of the makeup, the dirt, the oil, and bacteria left over your face from yesterday or if you had makeup on and everything didn't get off as much. What kind of cleanser do you need? You need for, first of all, people have different skin. So it's important to have like a cleanser with certain ingredients so you can get the right stuff for your body and your skin so it can be right. For dry skin, you need creamy and non-foaming substances with ceramides, hyaluronic acid, and glycerin. For oily skin, you need something with like a gel base and avoid stripping formulas such as charcoal, sulfate, and clay. Um, people with acne prone skin is the same as oily skin but with more creamy bases, so nothing would like inflame on your face, like pimples and acne, stuff like that. Sensitive skin, people with sensitive skin need something gentle and creamy with oatmeal, aloe vera, and vitamin B3. Step two, toner. Toner is a product to help prime your face up, so all of the ingredients afterwards would really sink in and it can also cleanse your face of any other product that the cleanser has not removed off your face. For acne prone and oily skin, you need something like, you will need ingredients that has beta hydroxy acids, like salicylic acid or something 
or something with glycolic acid or lactic acid to unclog pores, prevent breakouts, and dissolve blackheads over time. People with dry and sensitive skin and or sensitive skin, you need hydrating toners to help replenish the water, your skin barrier loss when you washed and dried your face. Step three, serum. Serums are normally, they normally come in a bottle, like a bottle with a, a glass bottle with a dropper tool. It's a dropper tool because you only need like a little bit. You only need like a little bit of it. Um, serums would contain concentrated nutrients, hydrators or antioxidants that you want to add to your skin, skincare, skincare routine. Type of serums, regardless of your skin type, anyone can use them. Anyone can use serums. Many dermatologists recommend getting vitamin C to protect your skin from inflammation and damage from the outside. And it can also brighten dark spots like hyperpigmentation. But it can be a little costly. Vitamin C is costly because of how pure it can be. So it's to keep that in mind. Um, if you have sensitive skin, use it every two mornings so it won't damage your face as much. Step four, spot treatments. It's important to choose a treatment that will affect the bigger problem of your skin rather than buying multiple creams and formulas at once. For people with dark spots and acne scars, use a spot treatment with either hydroponin, a skin bleaching ingredient, or vitamin B3, which gently brightens marks and scars over time. For pimples and breakouts, use benazyl peroxide, for whiteheads, why you can use salicylic acid for clogged pores and inflamed bumps. Step five, moisturizer. Moisturizer is another staple in your skincare routine that is required and used by many others. Many dermatologists say you must use it twice a day. For oily skin, more lightweight moisturizer with a cream or gel-based formula would do the trick. Dry skin, Ingredients such as hyaluronic acid, lipids, and proteins. Cream-based formulas are also acceptable. The last step, sunscreen. Sunscreen is very important. It helps protect your skin from the sun, especially in the summertime. It's important to have this in your skincare routine to lock everything in, but also so you won't be prone to skin problems in the future. The least amount of SPF you need for sunscreen has to be at least 30. Anything lower will probably not do you good. Using a moisturizer with SPF isn't as moisturizing as the real deal, since its natural benefits won't be present on your face. It's better than nothing if you're like trying to get a two-in-one, but it's not ideal at all. Step seven, celebrate. <clears throat> you finally have built a skincare routine that will be helpful and beneficial to your skin since you want to take care of it good. The things to remember, you will not see results overnight. Having a skincare routine has, it takes a lot of practice, patience, and time. It, you have to give your skin time to absorb everything and adjust to the new products that you applied on your face. Second, the lightest products go on first and then the heavier ones last. So if there's like oils, you want to put that on first because it's light and then more creamy substances, like creamy substances, like moisturizers and stuff, you can use those last, especially with um, sunscreen, yes. <laughs> and lastly, make sure your body is healthy as well because if you're, if you're relying on the skincare products to work and you're not putting in no effort at all, then it would not go as it will not go as planned. Plenty of, plenty of sleep is a good example, which is why many people have nighttime routines because your skin regenerates the most, it repairs itself the most during the nighttime when you sleep. And now for an affirmation, skincare is a form of self-love. Because you put effort into keeping your skin healthy and that glowing naturally. You're on a journey to loving yourself. Keep it consistent and the results shall be known. Thank you for listening to my presentation on skincare. I enjoyed researching because I don't do skincare, but it's very 
resourceful to learn about how to take care of your skin. So not only will this be helpful to you, but it's helpful to me since I've learned so many things about skincare. All right, this is my presentation. Once again, I enjoy you listening and thank you. What you've seen from virtually all of our speakers over the first two days of demonstrative speeches is how much time you put into the preparation, whether it be the slides, whether it be the delivery, watching yourselves with all of those takes that we don't see. However, before we go any further, one final time with feeling. Slideshow from beginning, making this full screen, then you take your webcam, and place it in this area, anything in the pink. If you have to move it a little bit, fine, but I don't want to see all of the slides on the far left-hand side for the rest of the term. Please make certain that you do that. And it's also how I'll be able to tell whether or not you're watching the videos in totality. We're doing a solid job so far, but attention to details matter. Nice job here when we go back to the title slide, speaking about attention to details, look at all of the data that's provided here, just on the title slide. The ultimate guide to perfect skin, and then centering everything right here, and then your name. All of these items, if she wanted to discuss it during a title slide, would be appropriate. And then moving on, to some of the eras of skin care with the stars basically being the bullet points. Then we get into the steps of the routine, keeping in mind that the steps would be part of the process with the cleanser. What kind of cleanser do you need? There's so much information here. She can dip in and dip out whether or not she thinks something is particularly relevant. Let's take a look at her on the webcam for just a moment. You can tell when you're concentrating because look at her eyes there. She's focusing on what she wants to say. And that's a relatively tight shot. Looks like she may have a ring light there. That's, that's well set up. And then moving on, looking at her eye contact to a certain degree, some of the steps of the routine. I want to play a little bit of this in real time to see whether or not her closed captioning works. It does. So we can sidestep that and move on. More of the steps of the routine with Serum 3 and other types of data with Step 4, the spot treatments, acne scars, moisturizer, lightweight moisturizers for oily skin, more steps of the routine, a lot of information here where you can be as consistent and as conversational as you would like. Step 7, celebrate. And then the generic thank you slide, which is certainly appropriate. Now let's go back, put it on closed captioning, mute the audio, and starting at the beginning and just little bits and pieces throughout, double check her ability to speak in complete sentences with the closed captioning and pay attention to how disciplined she is, as most of you have been, with the eye contact going to the slides, looking at the camera, back and forth. That shows how much you practiced. The closed captioning is humorous where it's SBCH rather than SPCH. It's not unusual for many of our demonstrative speeches to have some type of historical basis with a slide following the title slide in between getting into your steps of the process, which you'll get to. As you can see, she's speaking in complete sentences. I'm really unsure as to why sometimes the closed captioning on Loom's work and some don't. Not an issue whenever they're all uploaded to YouTube. The one thing, obviously, again, I would change is to make this full screen slideshow full screen, probably moving the timer to a slightly different location so it's not obscuring the text. In the first week, as you're well aware, we're all taking our baby steps, so it's not really a major issue 
right now. We just need to make sure that the trains are working on time and everything works fine. Look at her eye contact, the concentration that she has. All of us who wear glasses know what it's like to touch them during any kind of a presentation. The hand gestures are natural. Now I'm focusing not only on the closed captioning, but looking at her, looking at the slides. Same thing here. Same thing here. Same thing here. Let's pick it up in the last 30 seconds and listen to the end of her speech. Skincare is a form of self-love. Because you put effort into keeping your skin healthy and glowing naturally, you're on a journey to loving yourself. Keep it consistent and the results shall be known. Thank you for listening to my presentation on skincare. I enjoyed researching because I don't do skincare, but it's very resourceful to learn about how to take care of your skin. So not only will this be helpful to you, but it's helpful to me since I've learned so many things about skincare. All right, this is my presentation. Once again, I enjoy you listening. So thank you. And a little smile is always a nice way to wrap things up. I'll come on camera just for a moment to reinforce our presentations next week are informative. They're going to be more research based. Some of the items that many of you have included in demonstrative speeches have informative elements to them. Your title slide, then maybe an historical basis, getting into the demonstration itself as we've seen with all of the stuff that we've done so far today. I want to go back to our video from yesterday for this reason. You'll notice I go through the slides in random order, but now let's pick up a little bit of the presentations as we saw them in real time. Not my evaluations of them where I break down the video clips as you saw for each of the speeches that we had. You hear my voice rather than those of students. Let's return to the Class Collaborate video yesterday for just a couple of moments. And I intentionally want to be in a spot where we hear what you have to say in real time for your speeches. And let's pick it up with our first speaker of the semester, and we'll do it with everyone. With a gem like I have, you can have you can have really out there nails. You can even have bat wings and silverware if you would like. Nails is something that you can do at any time of the year, any time of day. These is your this is your time to really just express yourself. And a bonus step, do a little happy dance because you just saved a whole lot of money doing your acrylics by yourself at home because most mm -hmm. sets cost about, the lowest I've ever seen them is 150 to like $2,000. So you saved yourself a good amount of money. So good job, you, you did that. That was the end of our first speech. Now let's pick up a little bit of our second speaker where Jordan is talking about poetry. Here's the last minute or so of his speech. I have in my mind, I know what they mean and everything, but I just don't know how to spell them because I don't use them as often. It also helps me expand my vocabulary and find new words to describe how I feel and not always use the same words over and over again. It can get kind of redundant or it makes me feel as if I'm just writing the same poem, just in a different format. <clears throat> Some helpful tips when writing poetry is, it's good for you to know that you don't have to have a definite thing when writing. You don't have to use some some metaphors when writing. Only thing that is important is that you write down how you feel in that moment or anything that may be bothering you. You can write about loss, you can write about pain, you can write about, Something that happened to you when you was a child and it's just one of the happiest memories you ever had. Anything that you write just needs to be true to you. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. It doesn't matter how 
anyone else may feel about it. It's all about you and you expressing yourself. And then he gets to the end of his presentation. Here's a little bit of our third speech yesterday, which involved, this is beer tacos. Let's pick up a little bit of our third speaker yesterday. Again, just watching them rather than my analysis, them in real time. One minute. I began to add the toasted spice to the pot, followed by the seeded chilies, tomatoes, apple cider, cider and vinegar, etc. Make sure to use three cups of beef broth. Bring it to a simmer for 10 to 3 minutes until the peppers are very soft. I then transfer the mixture to a half power blender and pour it until smooth. Step four, add the beef back into the Dutch oven, followed by the chili sauce and remaining beef broth. Cover, cover bring to a simmer, then transfer to the preheated oven. I like to do two things to improve your overall ability regarding content delivery, and visuals. Not only do I like to watch these speeches over and over again, but also show you what you're like in real time. And then our next speaker of the day involved this particular topic on preparing for a job interview. Let's pick this up in real time. Lounge or move around when to the interview or even if you are nervous, but just stand proud and be loud and just be confident. Spend time practicing with trusted friends and family members to critique you on the interview process. So anybody that you trust or anybody you go to, just have them help you through the interview process. Step four, prepare thoughtful questions for the interviewer. You should take the time before the interview to prepare your thoughtful questions. So ask some questions like, why do you enjoy working here? What was a typical day here for you? All of you should do this to the point when you're watching your presentations, you almost feel like you're getting sick of watching yourself. That's how you learn. Our next presentation. This is the final touch. Um, yeah. But so you can always add whatever else you want to add to it. It's just how you want to do it. But yeah. Um, thank you for watching my presentation. Um, and that's the end of her speech. And then we went on to our fifth presentation, which was on hair braiding. And I want to get to the point where she's in the tutorial. I really like the fact that she's got the, the video tutorial as part of her presentation. Let's see where we are here. In my pit box. And while this is a little bit of a different technique because you're just grabbing a dread at a time, I still remain my three sections and I still remain adding hair and slipping underneath each one another for each section. And when braiding hair, I like to think of it as a crossing under motion because you're constantly crossing under and under each other to form the braid. And you can just see that I'm grabbing a dread, adding it to the right or to the left, keeping my pointer and my middle finger open to grab each strand and forming the braid all the way down. It's fascinating whenever we watch these in real time, primarily because of how much concentration you are providing. Here's another one. That um, the color pops more. And then I apply the shade that I desire and I smoothly blend it out. Um, you can even put some at the bottom to give you a more smoky effect. Step four, um, I apply the foundation all over my face with a beauty blender, AKA sponge. Um, you want to have you want to have that damp and you want to just gently dab it all over your face. And then after that, I go in with a neutral shade concealer and I like to put that in the forehead area, the chin and the other. The concentration is fascinating to watch. 
And that may be one of the last presentations. We, already, we have already seen the end of the comments, but I wanted to reinforce at the end primarily because looking at yourself, critically evaluating all of those elements in a positive way are going to assist you in getting rid of some of the elements, not errors, but some issues that you may have with your delivery, such as kinda, wanna, gonna, um, yeah, wanna, okay, um, kinda, like. Those are the types of issues that come up in everyday delivery that as time goes on, you're going to be much more smooth, much more thoughtful, much more knowledgeable, much more in charge or authoritative as a speaker. But it's baby steps. That being said, of course, with me being a very positive person, we're off to a very good start. Before we go any further, however, I want to return to Blackboard to discuss what's going to be going on next week with informative speeches. At the announcements area, this will change next week to week three. Instructor information, you can do a head start on informative speaking by checking out what I have on YouTube or by going to the SAU Mass Communication website and scrolling down all the way to this course. The itinerary for next week we've already discussed, but put it back up because Monday will be informative speech day one, June 14, informative speech day two on June 15, and then we've got on, I did that earlier in the week for some reason, let me do that over again. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the week of the 12th through the 15th. Research, Monday the 12th. Topic selection, Tuesday the 13th. Wednesday the 14th is day one for the informative speech, and informative speech day two is on Thursday, June 15, one week from today. So as we wrap things up for the week, I know there were a couple of you who had issues with your internet connection. Please make certain that you get those to me as soon as possible. We're going to be focusing on informative speech research on Monday, but for any of you who had an issue with not being able to send me the demonstrative speech on PowerPoint or Loom with the video inserted, we'll put those in at the end of class on Monday. Sometime on Sunday evening, the grades will be posted with a maximum of 20 points on Blackboard. Take a hard look at what you did this week, especially when it comes to the stylistic approach of making certain that the slide show is full before inserting your face. All of those little nuts and bolts issues are easily going to be overcome as we transition into informative speaking next week, then persuasive speaking the following week, and the final week with the wild card. However, let's keep up the good work. Any of the issues that we have with delivery or any organizational issues can be overcome in real time. Informative speeches next week are going to be more research-based. Make certain that you're here. Make certain that you watch some of the videos of previous informative speeches that I'm going to show you to help you prepare to be as research-based as possible. This week, you're speaking from your own frames of reference. Next week, you may have personal experiences, but it's going to be more grounded in research. Let's keep up the creative quality work. As for SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session of 2023, that concludes the recording session for today.